Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. And if more folks join us, then that will be great. Feel free to join at any point or encourage others to join. Um, okay, so today is menstrual health through the five senses. We'll be talking about touch. So the touch unit here is um, the second of five units on menstrual health through the five senses. So each week in April and into May, we'll be talking about uh, the different senses that we experience our bodies through. Specifically, um, we'll be talking about how to utilize this for uh, fertility awareness purposes and for general body literacy purposes as well. I was just talking about how um, this is the second of five units. Each one is going to be talking about a different sense. And today we'll be talking about touch. Um, a little bit about me, if you don't know me, my name is Nicole. I'm a menstrual health educator. I started charting my fertility a while back in uh, 2015. And then I started uh, publicly talking about charting and eventually started making more work um, alongside a lot of my research about menstruation. Um, and eventually I came upon the concept of body literacy, um, which has been something that I've been really diving uh, a lot deeper into and think that it could use a lot more development. Um, I also run a small farm, an herbal apothecary, that has a focus on preventative health and reproductive and sexual health. So um, I'm consumed by a lot of different elements related to um, this subject. And so if you want to access the images for today's lesson, you can go to learnbodyliteracy.com slash visual reader or learnbodyliteracy.com slash anatomy. And either of these pages will show you images from these books, the Body Literacy Visual Reader and Coloring Book, um, and their illustrations of various, um, various parts of what we'll be talking about today. Um, and fertility awareness and how to utilize the fertility awareness method as a methodology for um, understanding your body in a deeper way and has a lot of different applications throughout your whole life. Um, this class actually came as a part of a book that I wrote a few years ago called Fertility Awareness Through the Five Senses. And I wanted to open it up to menstrual health in general, just try to get people really excited about the subject. And so I wanted to just start with the basic definition for maybe some people are less familiar. Um, and if, if that is you, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat along the way. Um, so we'll just be starting with what, what is fertility awareness. So it's the self-knowledge of your fertility status. Um, anybody learn to read and understand the language of our body. So the fertility awareness method is more of a methodology. It's an umbrella term for many secular scientific systems for determining the small window in which a person is fertile each menstrual cycle. And that involves daily charting. So looking at the changes to the body, putting that information on a graph, and then that gives us a window into our fertility, our um, ovulation, our overall health and hormones. And so fertility awareness uses the sense of touch um, in order to make observations about the body. It actually involves a lot of touching um, and actually being activated with your hands and sensation and all of that. So it's uh, really taking those observations and then translating them uh, by putting them on the chart and analyzing and identifying certain patterns. So it's how you experience your body in your body. And fertility awareness, it is a method and it's most commonly known for contraceptive purposes or for conception, trying to conceive. So there's actually a lot of different things that you can use this for outside of those two things. Um, and so this graphic here is just showing us that the fertility awareness method can be used for a lot of different reproductive health issues, talking about breast health, sexuality, contraception, pregnancy, menopause, menstruation itself, all of these different things can be encompassed within um, studying your body through this charting method. And in 
in those terms, you know, we're talking about cycle to cycle, how maybe things change or you identify certain patterns, but there's also the larger pattern of your whole life. So we call this the menstrual life cycle, um, which is basically how your hormones change throughout each stage of your life. So starting in childhood when hormone levels are low and then puberty where they, you know, there's more activation of your hormones, they start to, you know, fluctuate more wildly. And then the adult menstrual years where there's a much more consistent rhythm or the reproductive years, you know, where there's pregnancy or breastfeeding that would pause that menstrual rhythm. And then there's perimenopause, which is sort of like a second puberty where there's again a fluctuation of hormones that ends in a very stable phase of life called menopause. Um, and so the framework of fertility awareness and body literacy helps us understand ourselves through each one of these phases of life. So it's not like it's you know contained just to your menstrual years, but your menstrual years will teach you something about the next phases of your life, you know, as you're moving into the next phases or the generations that come after us and, and how we teach them about their menstrual life cycle. And so what does fertility awareness do? You know, what, what function is it performing? So first, as we were just talking about with the menstrual life cycle, it helps young people understand puberty and bodily changes and destigmatizing their bodily fluids and clarifying their, you know, an understanding of their fertility um, and also the effects of, of STIs. It also helps people understand their choice of contraception um, and family planning. It can be used to help plan pregnancies or optimize preconception health, which obviously that is going to have a huge effect on better pregnancy outcomes, which is why I'm such a you know big advocate for people getting in touch with their body literacy um, in the preconception stage. And it also helps people better understand their whole reproductive lifespan and the risks and benefits of delayed childbearing as well. It can also be helpful for breastfeeding, for postpartum, understanding the changes that are happening at this time, trying to make sense of what's happening hormonally. And it helps people in general understand their hormones and reproductive health conditions that may um, cause hormone imbalances. Um, it can also be used by queer and trans people for specific health care that helps them with better autonomous understanding of their endocrinology. And it helps people transition into perimenopause and also helps people with abortion care, post-abortion care and pre-abortion care. So it, it just has a, a ton of different things to offer. Um, and, and that's why I'm such a big advocate for it. So now we're going to take a look at the menstrual cycle a bit more in detail and just try to understand what's going on. Um, in the ovaries, what's going on in the uterus, and what's going on hormonally. So this is a great graphic that shows us um, progression of a, a follicle that will become the next ovulation, and then also the luteal phase after ovulation. So we're looking at the whole menstrual cycle from one bleed to the next bleed, in this graphic, and we are seeing what's happening with cervical fluid on top. We're seeing what's happening with the changes in hormones where estrogen is the dominant pre-ovulatory hormone and progesterone is the dominant post-ovulatory hormone. And on the bottom, we're seeing the progression of the uterine cycle. So we're actually seeing how the uterus builds up new lining each menstrual cycle. So there's a lot going on in this graphic. But what we're trying to get at here is that the menstrual cycle is governed by hormonal change. That's what's driving the whole cycle each time that it happens. And these changes occur in different parts of your system, right? So the first is the ovarian cycle. What's happening when hormonal changes cause change in the ovaries? So there's four main phases of the ovarian cycle, and it has to do with the follicular development that ends up with ovulation and after ovulation, building a corpus luteum that provides you with more progesterone. And then in your uterus, you have sort of a different cycle going on, following those the same hormonal messages. And this has to do with the buildup of the new lining and what that lining is going to do after ovulation to potentially support a uh, fertilized egg. And so there's three main phases of the uterine cycle where there's, you know, menstruation, obviously getting rid of that lining and then making new lining and how that new line uh, progresses throughout the cycle. So those things are happening at the same time. 
as is the changes in your cervical fluid, which we'll talk about in more detail shortly. And so here is a, just a paper chart example of what the fertility awareness chart looks like. And what you're seeing here is basically a bar graph and a line graph overlapped. And what we're seeing on this chart is our three fertility signs charted out. And the three fertility signs are cervical mucus, waking body temperature, and cervical position. And so each of these tells us a little bit, you know, something a little bit different about our current fertility status. Um, and so cervical mucus is our most reliable diagnostic in the moment fertility sign, something that you um, can look at in the moment and, and know what's going on. And we chart our daily changes to our cervical fluid, be it examining our fluid on toilet tissue, in our underwear, or doing external or internal checks. Um, and then cervical position similarly requires feeling for the daily physical changes to your cervix by using your fingers and actually touching your cervix. Um, it's also a diagnostic sign, but it's considered more corroborative rather than primary. Um, and then thirdly is waking body temperature, which is our primary retroactive uh, fertility sign. So it's how we know ovulation occurred. Um, so it's something that we, we only find out after ovulation has happened. Um, and we confirm it with waking body temperature. And what you see in this graphic, what it's showing us is that we're taking these daily biodata pieces and we're putting them on the chart. And then you have a whole chart at the end of your cycle. And what you actually are seeing is a profile of your hormones, your ovulatory hormones of estrogen and progesterone. Um, and so each phase of the cycle tells us uh, something a little bit different about what's going on with the, the levels of those hormones and in a little bit more consistent way than a blood test would because we're looking at it over the course of the entire cycle. And then we're making um, more uh, analysis based on the, the changes to the entire cycle rather than a blood test, which is really only going to tell you what was going on with your hormones on one day. And then we actually look at cervical fluid a different way um, through more of a touch observation. So we actually observe the cervical fluid right at the vulva. And what you may be seeing when you are looking at cervical secretions or uh, what's happening at the exterior of your uh, vaginal opening at your vulva, it could be a number of different types of fluid. So the first is um, potentially mucus that comes from the lining of the cervical canal or cervical mucus, as we call it, cervical fluid. Um, and then there's also endometrial secretions, and which would be like a little bit of ovulatory spotting, right, that you might see. So you may see some secretions that actually come from your uterus. And then you also have the cellular slough that comes from the uh, cells of the vaginal walls, um, which is what we call vaginal cell slough. And <clears throat> a little bit about terminology here is that mucus is what we call it sometimes, um, but mucus sometimes has a negative connotation. And so fluid is, is a more preferred term for some. Um, it's meant to equalize the importance of our fluid to seminal fluid for fertility. Um, but it may be less appropriate at certain points of the cycle because certain um, cervical secretions may actually be more dry or solid. And so different types of secretion either encourage or impede sperm penetration and determine the state of fertility. So the day of the cycle is not important as not as important as actually focusing on what is going on with the quality of your cervical fluid. And so a person can only conceive, so pregnancy is only possible on days when cervical secretions allow for sperm to enter the cervical canal and reproductive system or what's called the fertile window or the fertile time. And these are the days that lead up to and include ovulation or about six to nine days out of the entire menstrual cycle. <clears throat> and here's another image from the visual reader that shows us the different crypts of the cervix and the different types of fluid that they make. And again, this is from the cover of this book, what you're looking at here, um, which is the actual epithelial cells, you know, the, the surface cells of the 
um, cervical canal and the cervical crypts rather that um, open into the cervical canal and deposit that fluid that then falls out of the body. That's what we're observing. <clears throat> and you might see that uh, in a better perspective here where we're showing the days leading up to ovulation and then ovulation itself, what's happening with the cervix, how those different crypts are getting activated and making more wet quality fluid during the fertile time. Um, and also how, you know, well before ovulation and then well after ovulation has concluded, the cervix cl is closed during those times. So it really only opens to allow for the cervical fluid to move out or for the menstrual blood to move out. Other than that, the cervix stays closed. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about using touch now to observe cervical fluid. Um, I don't know if anyone with us um, practices fertility awareness or is familiar with the different types of cervical fluid, but um, we'll be doing a short demonstration about that. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, of course. There's a couple different ways to check cervical fluid. Um, the first is uh, throughout the day um, when you use the bathroom, and that would be with an underwear check or a tissue check. So I'm going to demonstrate that for you here. Um, so an underwear check is, you know, pretty basic. You're looking down at your underwear and seeing if there's any uh, fluid that's present there. And for trying to understand um, the tissue test, I'm going to do this here. So when you, you know, go to sit on the toilet, right, you basically take your square paper and before you actually urinate, um, you're going to swipe from front to back, swiping over your vulva. So you might start around, you know, <laughs> around like your clitoris area and then wipe, you know, back towards your ass. And when you're doing that, you are going to feel for the sensation on the tissue as you wipe. Um, so if you just use a, a piece of tissue and you, you know, run it along your body, You'll feel that it's dry. You'll feel like a resistance, you know, to the paper and the dryness of your um, your skin. And this is because, you know, my skin's not wet, right? And so this would be, you know, a dry day, um, basically looking at, at the tissue, um, going to the bathroom and wiping and feeling that little bit of resistance. That's a dry observation. Then what you do is you, you know, finish wiping and then before throwing the tissue in the toilet, you're going to look at the tissue and see, is there anything on the surface of it? And if it's dry like this, what you'll notice is that you won't see a whole lot on here. Okay, so that is a dry day, but um, using a little bit of coconut oil to just show you what a slippery sensation might feel like. So you have that same toilet tissue. And again, before you're actually going to pee, you sit down on the toilet, you take the tissue, and then you swipe from front to back. And what you'll notice is that if there's a more slippery sensation, you'll feel your, your toilet tissue just run right over. So rather than there being a lot of resistance with a slippery sensation or a vaginal sensation that's uh, indicating a fertile sensation or high estrogen, you'll feel more of a, a slippery sliding feeling. It'll slide right over to the back. Um, and so that is one, one way that you can check your fluid every day is just through this basic toilet tissue test. Um, and if you see anything after, you know, you do that swipe, you feel wetness and then you turn and look, you'll usually see something on the surface and then you can pick it up and you can actually look at its quality and play with it in your hands. And all of that is part of the fertility awareness method and how we observe the cervical fluid. Okay, so that's tissue checks. Um, I probably do tissue checks like five times a day. Um, 
or more, depending on how much I'm peeing. And, um, you know, it will tell on a fertile day, like every single time that I'll use the bathroom, I will see the almost always see it there um, on the tissue. So um, it's a really good thing to get in the habit of looking at. And um, the other more active ways that we look at cervical fluid is through checking at the vulva. Um, and also, if you're doing a cervical position check, you're already reaching inside of your body at that point, you can pull out and pull out the fluid that's inside the canal and see um, what's there as well. But that's not at all necessary. So we really just rely on external vulva checks um, and what we see falling out of the vulva um, for our observations. And let's see, we'll go to the next slide here. We have some examples of what cervical fluid looks like. And um, they're kind of on an ascending um, trajectory here. So as you know, you become more fertile, like you enter your fertile window and then you're getting closer to ovulation, right? So as you crescendo towards that ovulation, you start to produce these wetter types of fluids. And these fluids are going to be more obvious to you through sensation, walking around, actually just feeling and being inside in you know your body and your clothes um, and feeling the wetness, as well as um, doing cervical fluid checks. So um, there are many different types of fertility awareness methods, and each of them sort of has a a categorization of the main ways that they talk about the different types of fluid that your body might make that are all fertile types of fluid. So there's many different consistencies that one might see. Um, and some are associated with like sort of uh, lesser fertility, you know, maybe at the beginning of the fertile window. And then there's some that are considered more peak fertility, you know, like if you were trying to conceive, like this would be like a great day to have um, sex on. So you have both um, types of like non-peak and more peak fluids, but both of them can essentially support sperm survival. And so all of them are fertile. And that's why it's important to know, you know, the different ones. And once you start to see cervical fluid, no matter kind of what type it is, you assume that you are fertile going forward. So um, dry is what we talked about first. Dry sensation, you know, um, when you're feeling your vulva all day walking around, you don't feel any sensation there. Um, you don't feel any fluid falling out of you. And when you do a check by swiping over your vulva and your vaginal opening, you don't see any fluid there as well. Um, so in order for you to count it as a dry day, all of those conditions need to be present. And they usually will be, which makes it easy. Um, then once you enter your fertile window, you'll start to produce these other types of fluid, like sticky creamy, watery, or stretchy. And honestly, people build their own categories as well, right? So it's all about your pattern of cervical fluid. And even what the textbook says it's going to look like, for me, it doesn't look quite exactly that way. So for each person, they're going to get to know their own cervical fluid pattern. But there are some major types of fluid that one might see. So I want to share those with you and just do this quick demo about what generally what they are. So the first is a, a non-peak fluid that you might see towards the beginning of your fertile window um, or at varying times during that window. And it's, it's called sticky. Um, and again, these categories are not used by all methods. Um, these are the ones that I started using when I learned about fertility awareness. And it's my understanding of it has expanded a lot from this. But um, these categories can still be useful to understanding the different sort of um, progressions of a cervical fluid pattern in a typical cycle. So the first one is sticky. And I'm just, you know, using a little bit of honey here to show that it'll be like very tacky. Um, and it won't really look like much either. It'll sort of uh, dry up on your hand a little bit when, you're, when it's exposed to the air after a few moments. Um, and it may uh, sort of stretch in your hands just a little bit, but breaks, you know, a few centimeters after. So it, it's not able to stretch one inch like some of the more fertile fluids um, are. Okay, so that's sticky. And that's something, uh, a white, sticky, tacky fluid that you might see at your vulva at the beginning of your fertile window. Okay, the next one is called creamy. And so creamy is more like lotion. So 
it'll have some body to it, right? It'll be very white um, and it will make like a white spot in your underwear sometimes. Um, it'll have a lot of body to it. It'll be easily identifiable on tissue. It'll sometimes be kind of globular. Um, or it can be, it can also progress to being more, a little bit wetter um, as well. And so um, I get various types of creamy, as those who are in the group with us can see um, that that production of creamy is very typical for me to make a lot of this creamy fluid in the fertile window. Um, it'll also be sort of lotiony when you rub it together. Um, so it'll feel smooth um, when you rub it together. Okay, so that is creamy. And that's a very common presentation of cervical fluid. And then we have um, watery, which is a type of fluid that I'll experience a lot as well, which is basically where the fluid has a lot of water content to it. So it'll just drip right down your body. It'll drip out of you and drip into your underwear, drip down your leg. It feels lubricative when um, you rub your fingers together. Oh gosh, getting hit with bug, evening bugs. Um, it'll feel like very lubricative when you rub your fingers together without drying up and it's a very fertile fluid for conception. So part of that, um, that slippery feeling that we feel with the tissue check, that comes from uh, somewhat watery or stretchy fluids. So watery will sort of look like this. Like it will just drip down just like that. So it will have lots of water content to it and it'll actually just drip right down. And it'll, it can be clear, it can be whitish um, as well. But the main thing about it is that it has the sensation of wetness that's like very obvious. And it feels <laughs> to me all almost similar to like that first day when you start bleeding and like the blood like falls out, that feeling of it starting to come out will also, I'll get that sort of same feeling with watery um, fluid as well. Okay, so that's watery. Um, and then lastly, we have stretchy, which is egg white, um, which I have an egg white here to show this effect. Spin barked, barkate is I think the German word for it. And it basically is like this. So if you can see that this fluid is nicknamed egg white for its consistency. And it's a stretchy fluid that is white or clear. And let's see if you can see in my shadow better. And it'll also come out in sort of mucousy, globular type of ways. It can be much thicker than this as well. I have some pictures on the next slide. And this is very fertile fluid for conception. Really, you want, you know you're at the height of fertility when this is about an inch, you can stretch it or further. And it'll hold too. So you can like move all around like this and it'll, it'll still hold its shape. It's very cool. Not even this egg white does that, but it will, it will hold. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool to witness. So these are our most fertile fluids. Is that really watery sensation and also this very stretchy type of fluid. Some people tend to get more watery. Some people tend to get more stretchy. Um, some people kind of like me, I tend to get like a creamy watery. Like it's like creamy and then I think both fluids mix together and it ends up being this like creamy watery type of consistency. And some people just get lots of egg whites so they get this really they're like oh i know what you're talking about i get that every month it's this very specific type of um change that their body goes through where they're like oh yeah for a few days a month i have this so um what you'll learn is your particular pattern right like how your body goes through this um pattern of producing more peak fluids and then eventually ovulating and after ovulation the fluid should dry up so you should feel this abrupt end to that patch of fluid and here's just some more images of stretchy um that is more like i don't i just don't make this particular thickness of it mine will be yeah it's just it's different for each person so it's cool to see other people's observations so all of these are fertile, as I was saying, you know, like even if we're looking at that um, non-peak fluid, 
it's still, it's an early secretion, but it's a secretion that could potentially support sperm survival. And then here's a little bit more about cervical position. So charting your cervical position is, um, you know, it seems like it's going to be kind of difficult, but it can actually be really fun. And eventually it becomes very, to me, it becomes very intuitive through my sort of experience of it through sex and um, just like knowing where my cervix is at. Um, I'll make those observations occasionally, but basically you're reaching inside your body and you're feeling the, uh, cer the ecto cervix. That's what we actually are feeling at the top of our vaginal canal. And it's an optional corroborating sign that you can check once a day. Um, when it's in its infertile phases, the cervix is uh, low in your vaginal canal and it's hard um, and it's closed and dry. So um, it'll be easy to reach with your fingers. And then as you enter your fertile window and you start producing cervical fluid, it will rise higher in the vaginal canal. It'll become much softer. It'll open and it will be obviously wet. Um, and so we actually observe this through a couple different ways, and you can do this with me now, which is basically um, the consistency of your hard cervix is going to be like the tip of your nose. So if you feel the cartilage here at the tip of your nose, and just close your eyes and sort of feel the press back, you know, that press on it and feel how it presses back at you, sort of thick cartilage. Then I want you to feel your lips. So in, co in contrast, feel how soft your lips are. So when the cervix is um, soft and high and open, it's going to feel more like your lips. When it's hard, it's going to feel more like the resistance from your nose. And lastly, I just wanted to, get, you know, talk a little bit about FAM tools. The first thing that one might need is a basal body thermometer, of course, and then um, FAM apps. Um, I trust Read Your Body and Drip because they're both encrypted apps. Um, or you can use a paper charting journal, um, such as the one that I designed, and there's many designs now, I think, out there. So... Now we're gonna move on to the interactive portion of our day, um, how we use touch to actually observe the menstrual cycle. So we use it a million different ways, basically um, for the toilet paper wipe sensation, for cervical fluid observations, for physical touch and sexuality, um, for secondary fertility signs, um, observing menstrual blood, you know, you name it, we probably use touch to get to it. Um, and we'll talk about this afterwards, too, which is um, other artists that have actually used their menstrual blood to create art. Um, so how do we explore our sense of touch to deepen body literacy? Um, so today's community engagement part of the, the unit here is encouraged, but of course optional. So you're welcome to share your art making screen with us. And I appreciate any documentation of your art making as well. Um, these sessions are going to be uploaded to YouTube as part of a public art archive. So for the next 20 or 30 minutes, we're going to work on a touch study, um, which can be 2D or 3D, whichever you prefer. And we're just going to start with some warm-ups um, just to get us started. So hopefully this um, presentation sort of ignited some thoughts for you about the sense of touch and how we interact so much with the sense of touch to understand our fertility. So if you have anything in mind that you would like to draw or like to work on in terms of a sculpture or otherwise, um, I feel like it's always useful to try and sketch that out. So for the first minute, we're just going to do a single line sketch, which just means that you're not going to pick your pencil up off of the paper. And I want you to think about what you would like to work on for today's unit in terms of touch um, in this sketch. So if there's anything that has caught your eye about what you would like to work on for a sketch or for a 3D piece of art, um, we're just going to take one minute and try and sketch that out and see how that how that looks 
like I said, you can go to learnbodyliteracy.com slash um, anatomy and you can reference the anatomy in there. So we're going to take our one minute starting right now. Okay. There's mine. Well, you can see that. Okay. Everybody doing good so far? All right, next. We're going to do a two minute sketch. This one, we're gonna just use basic shapes. So a little bit more detail maybe than this first sketch that you did. But trying to build off of maybe what you did on the first one. Okay, so we're gonna take our two minutes starting now. Oh yeah, I know. It's a good sunset here today. We're, I got so lucky with my golden hour. Thanks for chatting with us. So if you're just joining us, I'm working on just like the basic shapes of what I'm going to actually be sketching. Um, I think I'm going to actually try and do some 3D piece on this, but this is my sort of circular there's a lot of ovals in the clitoris which I just I don't think I ever really thought of it that way before but it's got like a lot of very circular pieces to it so we're just sketching out what we're gonna work on oh, there goes the Sun okay great so here's my two minutes just I built on top of my one minute sketch to just draw out these major shapes, right? Okay, and now we'll just take five minutes. You can take a break if you need to. You can set yourself up for a more detailed sketch. And then we'll spend about 20 minutes working on an art piece. So I'm going to go get some clay and I'll be right back. Okay, hello. I have my clay here. So I'm going to try and actually sculpt this. I don't know if it will work, but that's the fun in all of this. I want us to spend the next 20 or so minutes working on our sketch of choice based on touch. So how do you use your sense of touch to understand your body? So I'm actually going to be looking at the images from the clitoris section here to see if I can sculpt it. What I'm mainly interested in is the interior parts of the, of the clitoral body and the part that we aren't usually shown, right? So. There's this whole interior piece, a couple different pieces. 
So this is like the correct thing I'm trying to do right here. Which are like these leg sides to it. And I just made this modeling clay out of, um, it's like cornstarch and flour and salt. And it actually is pretty good for just homemade. So like in front of the Kura, there's these bulbs, the clitoral bulbs, or they're called bulbs of the vestibule. Because the vestibule is basically that space in between your inner labia, where your urethral opening and your vaginal opening are, that whole area is just called the vestibule. So behind it, you know, in the interior of the body, you have the interior part of the clitoris called the bulb of vestibule, because it's basically the bulb that's right behind it and around it. Okay, so mine don't look super bulbular. Make them more round. This is so funny. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> Had to put in a little support piece <laughs> underneath. If you're just joining us from Instagram, we are working on our 20-minute study of um, touch through menstrual health. So how we use touch when we're interacting with our menstruation. And part of that is uh, doing some art making here today. So our participants are working on their various art mediums to try and make some art that is connected to the concept of body literacy. So for me, I'm just making um, some designs with some homemade modeling clay. Um, this is my example of the cervix, I'm sorry, the clitoris cross section.
just checking in on everyone. How's everybody doing? Anyone have any questions? Um, feel free to put them in chat. Also, if you're just joining us from Instagram, you can also ask questions in the chat about this class or in general. I'd be happy to answer them. And thanks for, for stopping by um, and joining in on the class. Hopefully you've had a good Sunday so far. going to stop here. I'll show you all what I've done. And of course, I would love to see some other things from you all as well. Hello. If you're just joining us, we're talking about menstrual health through the five senses. And the sense that we've been working on today is touch. And I wanted to work with the clitoris for touch um, because I felt like um, this is an area that is highly sensitive, right? Um, it's known as one of the most sensitive places in the body. So to understand touch through um, getting to know the clitoris anatomy better, I thought it would be a fun project to work on today. So that was my focus of today's study. So I started out with a one minute sketch of that um, based on the anatomy drawings that I have of the interior reproductive system. And then I ended up going over that in shape form. So I, I just sketched out the major shapes that I was going to use for that. Um, and then I got to actually work on this model here. It's melting. It's really, really interesting to look at it through that lens as well because it's a reptile tissue, right? So here's my model. And mainly what I was trying to convey is that there's this big inside piece and the blue is really the um, the glands that people are familiar with the quote unquote exterior clitoris but actually this whole piece here which is the descending body of the clitoris it runs down along the surface of your skin so if you're, you're feeling from your mons pubis downwards 
this part here, the, the yellow part in my um, very silly modeling clay here that's falling apart, is showing you what's what's on the surface. So basically this can this the nerves that are coming through here to exit, you know, at the glands, they're all able to be stimulated through the skin. So you might notice that there's a clitoral hood that's on top of your clitoris that the glands actually pokes through at the end. So that piece is actually this yellow piece here. And so that whole piece is on the surface of the skin and is even though it's not exterior like the glands is when you touch it it definitely is on the exterior of the body so this part here the yellow and the blue are showing you the the part that essentially you can feel from with your fingers that you can touch and to stimulate from the outside and then these pieces here the orange piece that's like gravity is pulling it down and the red piece here are showing the interior parts of the clitoris right so the importance to this is that basically you have your clitoris here, you have the descending body and the glands that's able to be stimulated. And then below it, you actually have the vaginal opening, right? You have the urethra there and then below it, you have the opening. So the vaginal canal essentially is going through these two bulbs, you know, the, the canal is coming through these two bulbs. And so what I think is interesting about this is that the bulbs are really able to be um stimulated from the from the inside um from the actual vaginal canal from um the use of toys or someone else's erectile tissue that can go inside so yeah i just think it's a very interesting structure my crease is falling off that's okay <laughs> so yeah that's my this is my clitoris um and yeah i just think it's important to look at the the whole structure and actually play with the physical um, aspects of the interior and exterior parts of it and then the other thing i did was this one which is a cross section so if we took this glands piece and the descending body right we took this piece here and we cut it through and you're now looking at it through the cross section of the inside, right? So the erectile tissue and the, the nerves that are actually um, leading to the glands, right? So that that's my modeling clay here. And what I wanted to show was that at the top here, the blue and the red, these are describing the vascularization and the innervation. So the nerves and the blood, like the veins and arteries that flow um, in and bring blood in and out of the area, right? And what that does is um, obviously it brings um, sexual pleasure, the, you know, stimulation of the nerve nerves but the erectile tissue also expands so the clitoris actually gets erect um, similar to how a penis does because they have actually a very similar cross section if you look them up and so the corpus cavernosum is this yellow part in here and that's the erectile tissue that gets engorged when you become aroused so i don't know if it's going to work but Basically, as you stimulate the clit clitoris and the glands and the descending body, what will happen is this will expand. So it will pull apart like this. So there's little spaces in between the corpus cavernosum and those little spaces will expand. And essentially what it does is for the clitter it makes this piece here the glands here makes this piece here become erect oh, I don't know if you can become erect now but yeah essentially <laughs> so the glands when stimulated will actually become erect like this okay and the inside the the clitoral body like the cruce and the bulbs of vestibule they will also become engorged as will your labia and other things so this this is my my clitoris um sculpture for the day <laughs> and um 
What's really cool about this is just being able to see how long the clitoral um, descending clitoral body is, right? That it's actually much bigger than just the glands on the inside, of course, but also that this piece on the outside is rather large, okay? Um, and it also gets very erect during stimulation. So, okay, so that's, that is mine. Um, let me see, I gotta clean my hands a bit. Thank you for coming and enjoying that. Um, would anyone else like to share their art from today or just talk a little bit about what you just worked on um, before we wrap up here for the evening. Oh, that's okay. No worries. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you dropping in and hanging out. It was fun and messy, um, messier than last session. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share and, um, you know, touch is such an important um, it's such an important aspect of body literacy to me. It's pretty much like the cornerstone one. I know that sight is the most obvious one, but um, feeling and touch and like the feeling and experience of you having a menstrual cycle, I think is like what's, that's touch for me. Um, you know, like being in touch is touch. Uh, so yeah, I think it's really valuable for that. And um, it just has so many widespread applications once you understand the basics of it. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Um, I always try to break down this stuff into more manageable pieces because, you know, it would be one thing if we were like taught this when we were young um, and we sort of grew up with the teachings. You know, maybe that's true for some people and hopefully more people going forward, but um, I certainly wasn't. So um, I feel like I almost need to go back to basics all the time when I'm talking to people about this subject, like going all the way back to the beginning. So um, it's nice to um, do these types of, uh, you know, sessions where we can explore that through more of a, a slowed down um, sense of, of touch and, and art making as well. So it's really fun to be able to slow it down and actually just, you know, I've, looked at the clitoris drawing a lot just because it was a big piece of what I was doing in in the book and what I wanted to work on. But um, even just doing this drawing, it, it really does help me understand it in my own, my own head. Um, so for me, it's, I'm learning just as much as I'm teaching this. Um, so <laughs> thank you for coming and uh, participating. And, you know, it's, it's been great to have you all and Hopefully um, next time when we do spell, um, we can have some more fun. Smell will be another really different um, unit because smell is, uh, it's not something that's typically talked about in, you know, fertility awareness. Uh, it comes up maybe when we talk about vaginal health, like um, the health of the vaginal microbiome. And so we'll talk about that um next week and and just how to you know get in touch with your smell sense of smell um i use smell all the time in my my fertility awareness uh like charting i think i i'm pretty sure i use smell today um because i i like to understand the smell changes throughout the cer like the cervical mucus patch that i get i'll be able to smell like a big change from the acidic to more neutral smell um, of the of the fluid, um, and so will my partner as well. So it's very cool to uh, to experience that um, change, and also to regulate the health of the microbiome that way. So like I would know if something was off very very quickly. Jamie just said that um, her partner uses it as well and that he can tell when she's ovulating. Yeah, so it's, um, I feel like it's something that uh, both individuals and couples can utilize. Um, of course, it doesn't necessarily have the same, um, it's not charted like a primary sign would be, but it certainly is a secondary sign and charting secondary signs is, um, you know, it's a very helpful piece of the puzzle when it comes to, um, 
you know, just understanding where you are in your fertility um, pattern for that month. So for me, smell is, is really fun to engage with. Um, and so, yeah, the, the next three sessions will occur over the next three weekends. And um, I hope that you'll be able to join us for those. Um, if you did make some art today that you would like to share with the group, you can photograph it and um, email it to me. I'm at famtaughtme at gmail.com. And I'll enter it into the archive because I love seeing the things that you all create from this. And um, if you are around later, I am teaching another class in a few hours um, for the PCOS intensive, um, which is an eight month long um, course that I'm teaching about PCOS. And tonight we're going to be talking about the adrenals and the thyroid gland. So you're welcome to join us for that later. You can head over to my website for more information on that. Um, and we'll, we'll be meeting for the next four months as well. So even if you don't make it tonight, you're welcome to come to any of the other sessions. Um, so that's going to be it for today's class. And I hope that you had fun and that you enjoyed yourself. Hopefully you made some art. And I will see you all next weekend.